Welcome in everyone to the show. We're live. CT with the one and only EJ, Mark Berman. The streets are buzzing. It's time again for that season preview. Last year, you guys CT was on the money. And I love to hear what these gentlemen think. Uh, two of the best in the business. Welcome in, EJ. Mark, how are we feeling? Uh, thanks for having me on again, uh, CT and EJ. Hopefully my uh, technical difficulties will, uh, will clear up. But uh, things are going great and uh, looking forward to a, a great season. How are you guys? Listen, it's great to be back. It's been a while since I've been buzzing. Uh, but always checking up to see what's happening with the show. So, uh, Mark, and it's always a pleasure. As soon as I hear Mark Berman's on the show, it's like, okay, Long Island has to represent. So I had to be here today to uh, check out not just my friend CT, but the legend, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, the one Mark Berman. So, uh, CT, how you been holding up? Yeah. No, I'm doing great, guys. I'm ready for another season. Look forward to talking to you about it. But you both, I must say, look and fly. Mark, your retirement's treating you well. And EJ, I love the color coordination. It was a decision to, uh, I don't know if commemorates the right word, but to perhaps eulogize and fashion the Yankees season this past, uh, this past baseball season. So all of my Yankees fans stand up. Uh, hopefully Brian Cashman and the organization can figure out what to do with the minor leagues and to do with their situational hitting and perhaps uh, not top load the, uh, the, the, the lineup so much and perhaps get a better rotation, but that is a story for another show because we're here for the Knicks. The Knicks are buzzing. The Yankees are fishing. Um, let's get started with the show. Let's, I'm excited. Yeah, most definitely. And yeah, the Knicks are going to represent some optimism because uh, the New York football teams and the scene needs that boost right now. Uh, Mark, uh, there's been a lot happening in the East. Uh, you've been busy. I've seen you be, uh, frequent a few shows. Um, but look forward to getting your thoughts on what we've seen in the preseason so far. But where do the Knicks stack up, you know, in the East? How are you feeling about this, uh, this team heading into a really, really critical, you know, season and building upon last year's success? Well, I'll be honest. Uh, I don't know how much they've built on last season's success. It's, Basically, they're trying to do the continuity thing, and I thought they should have made a bigger upgrade than swapping Obi for Dante. I saw Dante the other night. He had a couple of beautiful steals, but offensively, uh, I think he's got to get uh, more chemistry with, you know, the guy's got to get to know him a little better. Uh, he's a very good three-point shooter, but he seemed a little passive on offense. You know, you read about these other teams, and, like, I feel Chicago is going to be better. I feel Atlanta is going to be a lot better. I feel uh, the Indiana Pacers will be better. So, you know, the fifth seed is the best they can do, in my opinion. And, you know, talking to a scout today, after the top three, he feels, you know, Boston, Milwaukee, Miami even, like fourth, you know, you don't know about Philly. Maybe Philly's fourth, but five through nine is kind of up in the air. Anyone could grab it. So I wouldn't guarantee the Knicks uh, a playoff spot. I mean, they'll definitely be in the play-in, though. Yeah, interesting. We will give our, our win predictions also. I'll put you gentlemen on the spot like we have to. But EJ, <laughs> um, any rebuttal, any, any thoughts to add on what Mark said? I, I, you know, one of the things we talk about all the time with the guards to the Knicks is that when we analyze our squad, when we analyze our favorite team, uh, you have to do it with respect to the other teams in the conference. And, you know, any any Knicks fans, any rational Knicks fan, um, the few of us that sometimes seem to exist, um, we have to be honest that uh, Milwaukee set itself apart um, during this, this particular offseason, that Damian Lillard trade, which I know we're going to talk about more. It really, it's not the same Eastern Conference, June 2023, as opposed to October 2023. Um, I think many of us thought that the Knicks would take a step forward because in part, we looked at teams like Philadelphia and we thought that as Philadelphia started to crumble, as Philadelphia started to fall apart, when James Harden demanded a trade, not knowing and always thinking about, you know, Joel Embiid's health, we thought there was a possibility that the Knicks might just take a step forward 
even if they just remained pat, if they stood pat, uh, Brooklyn is not the same team um, October 2023 as it was October 2022. Um, and so just that thinking, we were hopeful. Um, and this front office has shown that it wants to be patient. It wants to be diligent. It doesn't just want to make a move for the sake of making a move. It wants to make the right move, the perfect move. Uh, but with that being said, this offseason has led to several teams, particularly the Milwaukee Bucks, um, really taking a step forward and quelling a lot of the conversation that was taking place at the beginning of the summer. Uh, many of us were really excited at uh, the prospects of is Giannis leaving Milwaukee? Well, that seems to be a conversation that will be muted for some time. Um, and there's some other teams as well that when you look at them, uh, it's it's a different story heading into this particular season as opposed to last season. Though I do believe and I trust that the Knicks will make the playoffs without a question. Yep. Yeah. Remember, I was uh, a little more accurate in my predictions last year to remind everyone again. But yeah, look forward to getting our win projections. But Mark, um, you mentioned, you know, you think the Knicks can get the fifth seed. Okay. So what, for everything, for for them to achieve that, what would have to go right in your in your opinion? What is the, the, the thing that you can bank on for this team the most? And what is something that you're most concerned about? Well, to be honest, I'm a little concerned about Jalen and Josh uh, going over uh, and playing in the World Cup, knowing how many minutes Thibodeau is going to make them play in the regular season, I'm hoping there's not an early burnout for those two guys, especially Jalen. I'm worried. I'm a little worried about Jalen Brunson. I'll be honest. He came in in his first season uh, with the Knicks, you know, with a big chip on his shoulder, super motivated, super mo motivated every single night to, you know, prove that his contract was worth it, and he exceeded expectations. You know, this is his second season. I hope he doesn't have a Nick sophomore jinx uh, with the notion that he played in the World Cup, put a lot of miles on his body uh, over the summer when he should have been resting. And unfortunately, the USA, you know, disappointed. So it would seem like a waste of time. But I'm worried about Jalen and if Jalen is going to get better. I think... He may be the same player, which would be fine, but I'm hoping there's no slight regression. Same with Josh Hart. He came in, chip on his shoulder after the trade. He was a gangbuster, but we saw some flaws in the playoffs. He's not a shooter. He's not a three-point shooter. The team's laid off him, and you know he'll play a lot of minutes now that they want to play him as a backup four. So I'm worried about Jalen and Josh being as great as they were last season. Hmm. EJ, uh, my biggest concern is 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 really um, when you look at that backup four position. Uh, that backup four position is kind of concerning. Um, now, obviously, you can say, well, it doesn't really matter because you know Tom Thibodeau is probably going to play Julius Randle um, a large amount of minutes. Uh, it, we're now going into what I believe is the fourth season. And chat, you can correct me if I'm wrong. The fourth Tom Thibodeau led uh, season. And you know, there, there's a theory, there's a thought that those minutes start to accumulate. Um, and whether or not you subscribe to the theory that those minutes accumulate, we did see what happens when Julius Randle gets injured. We did see what happens, what happens when um, a Jalen Brunson gets injured. Um, towards the end of the season, that gave me cause for concern. Um, we saw what happens with our two best players. They're hampered with nagging injuries. And these were injuries that clearly clearly slowed them down during the course of the playoffs. Some of us thought that this, it was the Miami series was winnable. It was within reach, um, but we had compromised top stars. So without making a trade that really significantly improves the team, what we're really going to be, what we're really relying on is hoping that um, our players, we have a growth that occurs with some of our players. For example, could a Jalen Brunson take a step forward? Can he grow another level? Can he hit another level? Um, will RJ Barrett finally hit that next level that we've all been hoping for and praying for? Um, if those things take place, I think it will mitigate our concerns with regards to the backup four position. Um, questions as to what's happening with Julius Randle. Um, and, and also like, you know, to Mark's concern about Jalen Brunson playing additional minutes. 
uh, because you know we're not we're not going into season two. So again, these are some of the concerns. But I my other concern is really um, will we see the players that we need to take a, a, a second or third step, a Quentin Grimes, really elevate and reach their next levels? Mm, yeah, you both make some. Some great points. Um, I think every year is a new, brand new year. And I think Tom Thibodeau is definitely understanding of that. Uh, we heard some quotes. I'll ask, you know, if there's anything that stood out to, to you, Mark, in, in some quotes that were, were made. But I want to make the quick point that, you know, there's a lot of things in flux in the East still. Philadelphia, um, we don't know what they're going to do with James Harden yet. Uh, I think, you know, ESPN does have the Cleveland Cavaliers third. Uh, that raised my eyebrow. Uh, but what are your thoughts on, on yeah, the the East, Mark, and also you know any quotes you know that from from Tibbs and and and, and any of the guys in camp that's raised your eyebrow. <clears throat> uh, if you could hear me, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention Cleveland uh, when I was talking yep. about some of the teams that you know, could be better. You know, Mitchell and Garland now have a second year to, together. You know, you look at the Knicks roster, there's not one draft pick from the last two drafts. And, like, I'm just worried that, like, there's no in real infusion of talent. And I think that's off the record. You know, Tom has told some confidants that, you know, he, he, he feels like there needs to be a bigger infusion, and that's why he actually wanted the Knicks to actually make an offer for Drew Holiday when he became available. Uh, so, yeah, the, I think some teams in the East got better, and the Knicks essentially stood pat, and I'm wondering if, if Jalen is going to make his next step or, again, like I said, take a regression. But in terms of preseason – the other question is Evan Fournier. I mean, he can still hit the three-point shot. Can Fournier, uh, can Thibodeau find a, a way to put him in the game? You know, I know it's not a good thing to put in a guy ice cold in the final minute when you need three-point shooting, but maybe they could come up with some novel way of using Evan. And that could be a little bit of an upgrade with their three-point shooting. I haven't seen anything from Quentin yet. I, I know EJ mentioned we need uh, Quentin to take a big step. I agree. I said on a podcast a couple of weeks ago, I feel he could be an X factor to be that three-point sniper in the final minutes of a close game. Uh, so he hasn't actually been that yet. And let's see if we can make that leap. Yep, big year. You said it. That was another t talking point, EJ. Uh, RJ Barrett looks like he's improved his free throw shooting. He's going to be aggressive. He's going to get to the line, which you know may make up for some inefficiency. But Quentin Grimes doesn't have that part of his game yet, where he's physical enough to get fouled, and you know he, he can drive and kick it out. But it's all going to be about that three point shot, like Mark said. Yeah, I, I definitely think that if we're already at the point where we're discussing X factors, um, whenever we're talking about the performance of the team, you have to look at which players are progressing, which players are regressing. If we have concerns with regards to Jalen Brunson, his uh, abil his durability, um, that means that there has to be other they have to be other players who take a step forward. Um, for the past two seasons, uh, the question that we always had was with regards to R.J. Barrett. Will this be the season where he takes a step forward? Um, last season, the question was the extent to which R.J. Barrett would fit in with Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle. I think this particular season, especially because last season, Quentin Grimes entered into the season, particularly the end of the uh, preseason, with an injury, and he was hampered by that injury. And we saw that somewhat um, awkward transition from Evan Fournier to Quentin Grimes. I think this is the season where he's coming into camp, hopefully healthy, uh, starting the season, hopefully healthy. And this is where we're going to see year three. Is he going to take that leap? Because if Quentin Grimes takes that leap, I think it starts to answer the Evan Fournier conundrum. Um, last year, we complimented the team because you had two players, two veterans in Evan Fournier and Derek Rose, who were out of the rotation, um, you know, with a quarter into the season. 
And they were really, really professional about holding their tongues and not saying anything about their unhappiness. This is a different season. I have a friend of mine who says every NBA season has a different is a different story. Um, we now know that Evan Fournier is unhappy with his role. And we also know that Derrick Rose is no longer with the team. And so I, that's the kind of cloud I would not want to enter the 2023 season with. An unhappy player who's not getting enough minutes, who could be serviceable in another location. So those are just one of those X factors you just want to, this is where you see the marriage and you have to wonder if it's functional between the front office and the coaching staff. And that's one of those situations that has to be rectified. Yeah. My X factor is Quentin Grimes. He was RJ well, Barrett. But... RJ. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, no, I, well, EJ mentioned a good point about RJ. Because the one thing I noticed the other night, he, obviously he's improved his free throw shooting. Mm -hmm. And that's huge because he's going to get to the line a lot. But I still noticed the same streakiness, tremendous first quarter. Everyone on Twitter is going nuts. And then he kind of disappears in the final three quarters with a few turnovers. And he looked like the same old RJ. And, and that streakiness is, is a killer. The Knicks need this guy to be excellent and live up to that contract and play four consistent quarters and not have a great first quarter and then stink it up the rest of the way. And he didn't have a yep. great playoff against Miami. And listen, the Knicks aren't rebuilding. I mean, this is the, the drought is 51 years. Okay. It's time for them to make a real run, a real all-star yep. level. We lost Berman this season. He's back. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, remember the, the rant you went on last episode that went viral. <laughs> yeah. We were on the verge of something special there again. But yeah, Mark, um, yeah, looking ahead now for the, for the future of this team, I want to get your thoughts on, you know, Julius Randle's uh, move to WME, whether you feel or have heard anything that that, you know, signalizes potentially, you know, a, a move coming in the future. But recent, more recently, you know, fans want to know, Carl Anthony Towns as well. Um, do, you, do you really feel like there's any traction with that? Is he a plan B, C, D for this team, right? Surely Embiid and Giannis and, and maybe Donovan Mitchell is still preferred target. I mean, the Carl Anthony Towns thing is, I've, I was Googling my story Christmas Day 2019 when I first brought up Carl Anthony Towns and the CAA uh, connection and monitoring his situation in Minnesota. Uh, listen, I, I think some people in the organization would love to have him. CAA, I'm sure CAA would love to get him uh, to New York for all the marketing reasons and, you know, obviously an upgrade. He's an excellent three-point shooter. I don't know if he's tough enough. I don't know if he's the difference maker to win a championship. Uh, and his contract is outrageously large, so much larger than Julius's. I don't know what Minnesota would want. I, I think it's going to be a tough one. But Donovan Mitchell in a year, yes, very plausible. Um, and, you know, there's other guys that, listen, Zion Williamson – I know the Knicks checked in with him early in the summer to see what New Orleans is thinking. And, you know, New Orleans is sort of in a holding pattern waiting to see, you know, is the guy going to get injured again? So, and they don't, if he does get injured again, then his market value really decreases. So, um, yeah, there was one other name uh, with Joel Embiid. I mean, is Philadelphia just breaking it up? I mean, uh, maybe they are. Maybe Dal Murray is just going to, start from scratch and that's the Knicks only hope to get someone like Joel. Mm. Mm. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, you know, I, I don't want to be a Danny Downer, uh, but this is, this is the quintessential conundrum that we find ourselves in is, you know, the need to improve knowing that we are not on the same level as a Milwaukee, knowing that we're not on the same level as a Boston who, my gosh, master stroke and getting a Drew Holiday um, especially when many of us were wondering why get rid of a Marcus Smart. Um, but 
the issue that we have now is that all of the transcendent players that we've discussed, with the exception of Donovan Mitchell, there are conceivable pitfalls of acquiring those players. You know, for example, at Joel Embiid, one of the things that many of us have not realized or come to accept is why would a Daryl Morey in Philadelphia trade a Joel Embiid to one of your biggest rivals mm. 90 minutes away in New York City? You know, is there going to be a Northeast tax that the New York Knicks would have to pay to acquire mm. Joel Embiid? Um, <laughs> one of the pitfalls of acquiring Zion Williamson, you know, this is a family friendly show, uh, but his off season was rather interesting. And so would we want that? It, would the front office want that kind of <laughs> that kind of smoke? And that's a euphemism. Um, happening in New York City, um, you know, and, and he's not a bad kid, but, you know, New York City does offer um, some trappings that, you know, you don't necessarily find in New Orleans. So, you know, each one of these players that we've mentioned, short of Donovan Mitchell, um, and I did intentionally say short of because the, it goes back to the initial issues that we had in the summer, uh, the summer of 2022, is do we want to pair Donovan Mitchell with a Jalen Brunson to to create a somewhat diminutive backcourt. And so this is why this this year is going to be really fun. I don't have a, a, a prediction, but some of these players will be available, but they do each present particular concerns and, and realities. And, and I think that's yeah. going to be sobering for some of us as Knicks fans. Yeah, and, and fit, gentlemen. Like, it's all good to say this player is skill and I want this name on the Knicks how do they fit with what we have? You know, who might be going out, Mark? And there's some great questions in the chat. We'll try to get to as many as we can. But one prominent name, Emmanuel Quickly, Mark, you know, extension eligible coming up. Is he the, uh, the preferred piece that would, would be outgoing in a potential move, right? Does it make sense for the Knicks to tie up someone long term as a bench piece? Or do you feel like uh, someone else? might be uh, outgoing. Um, yeah, I, I only caught uh, some of the question, but in terms of Emmanuel and the contract extension, mm. I mean, the Daily News just uh, published something online about mentioning in the lead four teams that would be interested in Emmanuel uh, next season as a restricted free agent. So you know that that his agent, Raymond Brothers, is working overtime trying to scare the Knicks uh, into uh, getting a deal done. Um, I can't remember the teams, but Utah was one of them. Uh, yeah. He's a backup player in the big picture on a championship team, and to give him a crazy amount of money, and I know, I know they were looking for a crazy amount of money uh, many months ago, at least before the playoffs. So it's going to come down to the wire – uh, Raymond Brothers is going to have to compromise. Uh, the Knicks look at him as a backup, and you know you can't pay a backup crazy money. And I think push. Uh, if a gun to my head, I say no contract extension for Emmanuel. I think Raymond is doing his due diligence, and he knows that there will be a team uh, that will pay him. Yep, as we we just locked Mark. He'll be back, but I was going to say, EJ, I feel like it's a, it's a matter of extending quickly and then probably look to uh, maximize his value at some point in the future um, because, yeah, uh, he, he can be a capable starter, I feel. Mark, I feel like Emmanuel quickly can be a capable starter in this league and another team is going to look at him uh, that way. But, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I'm coming in and out on the audio, but... Uh... The question is, can he be a capable starter? Yeah, do you feel like all it, all it takes is one team, Mark, to feel like he's he's a capable starter, and then they might make a, a move? Yes. Yeah. Right, exactly. I mean, again, this story coming out that four teams are interested in him as a restricted free agent is definitely uh, trying to uh, get the Knicks' attention. So... Is he a starter? I, most scouts still think he's a great sixth man and may not be uh, a 35-minute-a-night player, more of a spark plug type. He disappeared in the playoffs. He's still young. 
Uh, I'm just not giving him a boatload of money right now. Mm. Mm. Yep. Mm. Interesting. Uh, now the time's come for some predictions, some win predictions. Uh, gentlemen, how about EJ go first? All right. Well, last season, I thought that the Knicks were going to be a play-in team. Um, I'm glad that I was wrong. They had a surge, you know, particularly in the back half of last year. Um, this year, I, I'm going to say that the Knicks will be uh, the fourth seed in the Eastern Conference uh, in terms of their win-loss record. Uh, we know that Tom Thibodeau, one of the things that we've learned uh, as a student of history is that I respect history and I respect the patterns that people show us. Um, and Tom Thibodeau has shown that he takes the uh, the regular season very, very seriously. So he will push this team to win as many different games as possible. So if the Knicks are healthy, I believe there will be a fourth seed who uh, whose record will be 51 and 31. Whoa, 51. There we have it. Mark Berman, you're up. EJ uh, beats me on that one. I'm going to go uh, 47 wins, the sixth seed. Uh, as EJ said, Thibodeau is the greatest regular season coach in NBA history. The problem is his playoff performance is, is not matched his regular seasons. So uh, a sixth seed, listen, he does a lot with, not, you know, scouts will say they'll compliment them and said Thibodeau wins a lot of games for the amount of talent he has on the roster. Uh, and that's because he doesn't rest anyone and he plays them 35 to 40 minutes, whether it's a yeah. February in Detroit or on national TV against the Lakers. So uh, I, I just feel that talent wise, they didn't get any better. And I'm afraid that Jalen and his durability, he had some injuries last season the World Cup, I think, could be a factor. He could run out of gas. So I, I'm not expecting more than 47 wins. And, <clears throat> again, there could be a trade, but Leon Rose at the trade deadline, he's been very cautious. So, uh, you know, if Manuel doesn't get signed, I'm hoping that maybe he could swing a deal with Emmanuel uh, and, and, and get something that they need if they're really hurting at, at power forward. Uh, and if Julius... Ooh, you were mm. just getting the rest of that explanation. Yeah, if Julius, he was going to say, I'll suggest, uh, has a healthy year, um, is a key piece yeah. for this team. Um, so, Burma's, so Burma says 47, uh, 47 and 35? Yep. Yep, you're back, Mark. 47, you're gone. Six seed. That's playoffs. That's mm. that's avoiding the play-in. Um, I'm going to go 48, as I've been saying. Wow. 48 wins. Yep. You've gone so, 51. You've trumped me this year, EJ. Well, I mean, the reason why is because um, I think that there are some teams that are really going to be some bottom-feeding teams. Um, yeah. For example, uh, you know, Orlando is still very young. Um, I think that there are some teams that will struggle. Like, for example, a Detroit will be somewhat improved, but I think still that they're very young. Um, I think that there's there, the Pistons. Uh, I just said Detroit, sorry. Uh, but I think there are some teams, like I can see Brooklyn um, struggling at times this season. Um, I can see some other teams, like the Raptors. What exactly will the Raptors be? This particular season, will they trade Pascal, Siask Pascal Siakam during the during the season? Will they trade OG and OB? Um, and again, there's Philadelphia. There's some teams that um, I like it when they're in flux because when they're in flux and you have two top heavy teams, chances are they're going to be sellers because they realize there's no move we can make to ascend into the upper echelon of the conference. And so that's to the benefit of like that second tier of teams, which I mm -hmm. think the Knicks are in this year. Yep. Mark, you're back. And uh, appreciate your time, Mark. Uh, did you have any thoughts on uh, Jeff Van Gundy? For, for the second. Yeah, so let me sign off. My wireless is just horrendous. Um, yep. But just one pop. Uh, if anyone uh, watched the uh, preseason game against the Timberwolves, 
Uh, Bill Pito uh, was play by play, fill in last minute, did a great job with Alan Hahn. It was really the first play by play game he's done in, I was told ever, which was hard wow. to believe. Someone told me wow. that was the first he's ever done. Uh, I mean, not even in college. I figured he would have done something in college. But uh, yeah. if when he's on the year show again, you know, job down and uh, it was seamless. But uh, yeah, thanks so much, guys. But I'm going to sign off with this wireless so shaky today for some reason. No, but I enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for having me on. And carry on. Uh, I know you're going to keep on uh, discussing Knicks basketball. Yep. No thanks doubt, so much, Mark. Mark. We appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. Talk to you throughout the season. Mark Berman, kind enough to join us. EJ with CT here. The streets are buzzing. The chat buzzing. Smashing that like button for another New York Knicks season. Um, yeah, you kind of caught me off guard there, man, with the 51 wins. <laughs> um, last year, I was more optimistic. Not that I think yeah. 40, I mean, 48 wins. I think that's good enough to get us fourth. I, I really do. Uh, yeah. Do you think? I think the, yeah, no, I think, I think, you know, 51 is the upper limits of what I think they can win. And again, that's because, you know, um, I still think there's a culture of resting superstars. So I can imagine there'll be games, for example, where Giannis and Dame, especially because Dame is a little bit older, um, where Milwaukee isn't really concerned about the cup. They're not concerned about the regular season. And obviously I know the rules have changed slightly, but you can see Milwaukee deciding, listen, we made this super move to win championships. Giannis has declared he's in this for championships. So if we have to leverage some games during the regular season and manipulate the new rules so that he can get some rest or the additional players can get rest. He'll do that. Um, I see the same thing with Boston. Um, KP, for example, is going to be an integral part of the rotation, especially because they don't have uh, Robert Williams anymore. So it's going to be important for those upper echelon teams. There might be games where they decide we'll figure out a way not to show up. So even if it means uh, we dress our players, but they play for six minutes, well, that's a rest. And that that's in line with the new rules. So um, I do think that it's really possible for the Knicks to win 49, 50 games because Coach Thibodeau is really a throwback to the days of the 90s and trying to win every single day, every single game in the veins of Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley and Hakeem Olajuwon. So that's why that's where that's from where my estimate arises. Yeah, definitely. And, and I love fans that do count the rest of the league like Khalid salute and, uh, you know, we got. A lot of optimistic fans. We've got fans that are a little bit more wait-and-see approach. You know, we want to see mm -hmm. what the rest of the, the East looks like because it's not to say that Knicks aren't as good as last year, but the scouting report is out now. Yeah. Like, yeah. can the Knicks, do the Knicks have a, a, another trick up their sleeve? Do they have more in their playbook? Or is it hope that Mitchell Robinson can just continue to pull down every offensive rebound and give mm -hmm. us a, a second chance? Um, how do the Knicks look in, um, in the playoffs? Uh, how is the health of this team going to be? You know, Mark raised a great point about Brunson being quite durable last year. You know, um, we pray for injury, uh, for no injuries and for, for good health this season. Yeah. But if there were to be an injury, you know, uh, is that going to really um, be a huge hurdle? Um, so in terms of that, yeah, 45 wins, I can see... Teams like Indiana improved, fam. I could see Orlando being more difficult to beat. Um, to be honest, I, I know it was a preseason game, but Minnesota looked like they can definitely outscore a lot of teams. Um, yeah. Is there any yeah. any any particular um, part of the schedule? Uh, I don't know if you've really gone through the schedule, fam, but do you feel like the Knicks will hover around 500 to begin with and then get going later? Or do you feel like we'll start well? I, I think that's the difficulty. I think that one of the things we've seen more recently with the NBA, the NBA has kind of become like the, uh, the NFL where mm -hmm. that first, you know, 20, 30 games, it's an extent, it sometimes feels like an extended preseason. Uh, you know, one of the things they talk about with regards to the NFL is that there are preseason games and then add the first four, uh, first regular season games and you're still trying to figure out camaraderie you're trying to figure out team teammate uh, chemistry you're still trying to understand your playbook um and i think with uh the knicks really trying to take the next step and i think that they're trying to walk this fine line 
between consistency and also trying to add important pieces like a, a Dante DiVincenzo, we still have had like roles change. And I think that that will still be significant through the first uh, fourth of the season. Um, we also have this new, um, this new championship cup. Um, and we have to see how that fares out, like the extent to which um, teams will take that seriously, players will take it seriously. Um, and also, again, the resting rule for, the, uh, for, for, for teams as well, too. Um, it's important. Mm -hmm. All of these factors will really shape the first fourth of the season, the first quarter of the season. Um, and, and I know that Coach Thibodeau will go, you know, zero to 100 as much as he can. But I, I always I always look at the um, the rhythm of the first quarter of the season and a lot of teams struggle the first quarter of the season. You know, think about how many teams we had last year and I'm forgetting off the top of my head that we thought were going to be world beaters the mm -hmm. first quarter of the season and only for them to be at the bottom third of the conferences. Yeah, definitely, man. I think it's going to be a filling out process for these teams with new pieces that's why I feel like the Knicks will get off to a decent start. I'm not going to say really super hot start, but mm -hmm. decent. And I think if we hover around 500 for 20 games, it is going to be a, actually more of a good thing than bad. Um, obviously, I would love to be way over 500, but the reason I believe it's going to be okay if we're over 500 or around 500 at the 20 game mark, the, the Knicks have shown the last two years that they do get on streaks at some point in the season later as more uh, chemistry and more um, cohesion is built. And I feel like the Knicks will do that. Uh, the thing is, this team has a lot of fighters. They have yeah. uh, players that just arise above adversity, players with a chip on their shoulder. Talking about all their backgrounds, fam, with Julius Randle, with, I, uh, with uh, Quickly, with uh, Barrett, Brunson, they've all got things to prove. And I think if we lose three or four games in a row, I'm not going to sweat it because I think this team has the capabilities of bouncing back like they've shown time and time again. Remember how many times last year it was, is Tom Thibodeau going to get fired? Yeah, you know yeah. What's going on with this? And what happened? They ended up pulling together an eight-game, nine-game win streak. And I think you add Di Vincenzo into the mix, a full year of Josh Hart, I can't see this team winning any less than 47 games uh, without a major injury. Yeah, I mean, that's always the caveat. And, you know, one of my favorite interviews that we've ever done was with Bill Daughtry. And one of the things he said, he said he doesn't do pr uh, prognostications. He doesn't do predictions because in part, like you have to be able to predict the injuries as well. Yeah, so this is exactly. all things being equal. There aren't any injuries, uh, which is very hard to predict. But I do think the Dante DiVincenzo trade uh, the Dante, sorry, the Dante DiVincenzo signing um, is important, especially because regardless of how we feel about the Obi Toppin trade, at least we're starting to get more clarity in terms of the Knicks roster. Um, one of the unfortunate things with regards to Obi's position on the team last year was that there was a lot of there were a lot of questions that we had as to what is his role on the team. I think we're starting to get a little bit more clarity as to our top nine, who they are and what their roles are. Is it perfect? No, it isn't perfect. But I think the more that you have definition as to what one through nine, what they're doing and what their roles are, the higher your win total should be. Yeah, definitely, man. And I know you caught most of the uh, Minnesota game. Did you notice mm -hmm. how fast they were trying to play with Absolutely. 26 fast break points, man? Um, my only concern is we know in the fourth quarter, man, you can only play so fast that the game slows down, the defense buckles down. How do you feel like we can close games out? Last year, we lost quite a few, remember, heartbreakers, cardiac nicks, all of that. How do the New York Knicks avoid that now going into the fourth quarters? Uh, is it a lot more of Jalen Brunson you t lead us to victory? Everyone get out of the way. Or do you feel like Jalen Brunson should defer more and um, stretch the floor out? Do you feel like DiVincenzo is a, is a candidate to take some closing minutes with IQ maybe? What would you like to see in, in fourths? I think one of the issues that we've had in fourth quarter, um, fourth quarter uh, uh, play 
and and playoff basketball is I mean because there's a lot of parallels between fourth quarter play and fourth quarter production and the playoffs. Um, in the fourth quarter, it's harder to ISO because you're going to have defenses that just pretty much stack against the ISO player because they know, all right, if you have a primary ball handle like a Jalen Brunson, I know that I'm going to have some sort of wing really just fall down into the paint because I know that he's going to try to operate, get into the lane, draw a foul, or try to score. Um, unless you have that um, all otherworldly talent, like a Kevin Durant, who's able to create his own shot and shoot above any defender, uh, you know, a Jokic, and they're able to create in ways in which defensives really just can't stack against them, then the best option is using intelligence. And so I would love to see fourth quarter, a discipline where the Knicks are using a mix of ISO and plays. And I think that's one of the primary deficiencies that we have is that a lot of times the ball movement, as Clyde just routinely has said over and over and over again, the ball movement just stops fourth quarter. Um, so if we can get into the healthier habits where ball movement doesn't stop as much fourth quarter, that's good for at least three, four wins because you're not going to have predictability in your offense. You're not going to have an offense that's been that's being geared or being um, being powered by fatigue. You're having an offense that's being geared and motivated by intelligence. Yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, before I open the floor to EJ, it's great to have you back. And Thanks, for eventful off season um apologies for um mark's uh, wi-fi issues we we're planning to go a few more minutes and, and get through a few more questions but i'll make sure i get this question to mark our fan buzzer beater was asking mm. wanted to know why um didn't we go after a guy like taj which was yeah kind of surprising did you have any thoughts on that no not not really i i, I guess i guess the reason why we didn't go after taj is because uh, you know i think there may have been other plans um, for the front office. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we talked about, and we actually talked about this off stage, is that not every plan comes to fruition uh, just because you might want a particular player. And I'm not saying that the Knicks didn't want Taj, but they may have had designs on another player. Uh, they may have had designs on um, a trade. And it's just that as you were focusing on the trade, players mm -hmm. get signed. Players decide to go for the comfort of a contract in hand as opposed to a contract that might occur in the future. So, I mean, I think that's probably what happened in the case of Taj. Um, I do think that, you know, with Derek Rose not being on the roster, or Taj, yeah. not, or Taj Gibson not being on the roster, mm -hmm. you, do ha you don't have that Tom Thibodeau player on the court in the locker room, and that's kind of interesting. Yeah, you raise a great point. I was going to mention D. Rose, fam. Um, and I, I agree with you, Buzzer. In my in my opinion, I think he he wanted a larger role, um, and maybe he just yeah felt like those couple of years with the Knicks, he fulfilled his um, his uh, desire to play in his home hometown. But I think at, at the end of the day, there's got to be a reason why the Knicks didn't ask him to come back. I, I think he would have said yes. Um, so I think maybe the Knicks wanted to go in another direction. I'm going to assume the Knicks didn't. Uh, want to want to prioritize him, uh, but yeah, guys, chat. If there's any other questions, we'll uh, we'll go for another ten fifteen, and I will answer any questions you guys have, and I will get through it. But EJ, uh, the floor is yours in terms of what's happened around the league, the East. Uh, there's been some rule changes come up yeah. now. Um, the coaches can get a couple of challenges now after yeah if they win. There's the load management thing. There's the NBA Cup. Uh, yeah. There was FIBA. Uh, what what it do? Um, yeah. Well, first off, it's just good to be back. It's been a while since um, uh, since I've had a chance to be on. You know, um, I love being on the show, and so life was ha life was lifing, um, as the kids like to say. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's a lot that's taken place over the course of. Um, over the course of this particular off season, heading into 2023, I think the um, I think the the championship cup I, is I think that's the name of it. Um, it's going to be a really interesting um, progression. Like I'm someone who I think that um, this season there are going to be a lot of people who are going to challenge it and say, "Why are we doing this? You know, what's the? It's not really that important." I do think that one of the things I do like about the NBA, and if you know anything about the history of the NBA. The, the NBA has always been willing to experiment to make it a better experience for fans. 
Um, let's not remember there hasn't always been a three point line. You know, <laughs> you know <laughs> if you go back to the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, there wasn't a three point line. And imagine the NBA without three pointers. Um, if you think about, like, for example, the defenses that existed in the 90s, the hand checking, um, I mean, the New York Knicks of the 1990s would have been nothing if Derek Harper could not hand check, you know, someone at the top of the key. Um, it's one of the reasons why we've seen scoring explode in the past 10 years. Whereas when I was growing up, if it were a 90 to 85 game, it was remarkable. As a matter of fact, there used to be challenges throughout the league where restaurants would sponsor. If your team could hold, <laughs> you know, the opposing team yeah. under 90 free burgers, miles, and you get free burgers, free chicken. So um, <laughs> I think this will be something that many fans will make fun of. Many pundits will make fun of and say it's a waste of time. But who knows what this might be in five to 10 years? Obviously, I don't know what it's going to mean for the culture of like, do we raise a banner? Because that's like another question that people raise. Uh, but I do love the fact that the NBA is one of the reasons why it's my favorite sport is that it has always, always been willing to try to do new things to maintain the excitement and fan attention. You know, think about how baseball has had to try to change in the past couple of years. And it's because it it's very hesitant. It's a sport that's incredibly hesitant to change. And, and in part, because of that, it's gone from being the number one sport in the United States to perhaps being the number three sport. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's just something to think about, like, especially if you're a fan of basketball, not just a fan of the Knicks, which I love the Knicks, but I also love the sport of basketball. And it's important that kids grow up loving the sport and that it continues to evolve so that it never dies. So that was one of the things that really stuck out to me this particular summer. What, yeah, what about yeah, you, no, CT? Yeah, no doubt, man. I think, look, it's hard to not be fascinated by all the trade talk. Um, mm -hmm. I think FIBA held some things up and then we finally got the Dame domino to fall That's and great. then the drew holiday one was crazy um for me i think the knicks are still you know they 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 kick the tires with drew holiday and it's interesting you know berman talked about tom thibodeau was was one of the guys in the organization that pushed the knicks to you know implore it and and the knicks did it uh, but i don't think it made sense i think no. the majority of knicks fan base agrees that we would love drew holiday on the team but to make that transaction, it would have been difficult. You know, you would have had to give up uh, a little too much, I think, for a guy who's not really going to uh, win us that chip. Um, but interestingly, you know, I love your predictions, but we all, I think, agreed with a guy like Quentin Grimes, EJ, this year, and how important he is. Um, uh, I had RJ Barrett as my X factor for this team yeah. to help the team get to another level. But I'm seeing RJ progress with the foul shooting. I'm seeing him uh, aggression in the off season. Him keeping his head up and and passing the rock. I think it's it shifts to Quentin Grimes for me. If Quentin Grimes isn't drilling the three ball, what else is he giving us? It's it's fair to start asking that now in his third year. Um, a guy who's going to be due to get paid in one year's time. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if Quentin Grimes is just a stand there, catch and shoot, could could that be an area where we look to make an upgrade at the two spot? You know, I, I'm not saying I want to kick Quentin Grimes to the curb, no way. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying this is a big year, fam. Is that is that fair to say? Oh, it's, it's absolutely fair to say. I, I, it's, it's, um, it's why you have to look at the arc of a period of time for an organization. Um, like when we look at the, for example, the Isaiah years, or we look at the Phil Jackson years, you know, we're now strongly in the Leon Rose years. Um, in terms of understanding where this team can go, remember last season, we were starting off with Evan Fournier. And there was a question of um, if Evan Fournier is not the guy. And this season we're coming to the question of is Grimes going to develop and be that guy. If Fournier and Grimes are not the guys, that means that you have a hole in your starting roster. And that's why we have to be concerned. Um, yeah, and I think right that's point. that's that's really why like you have to look at the trajectory of an organization under its leadership. Because without Grimes shooting and really opening up space, 
it's going to come back to that same thing we've been talking about the last few seasons, which is Mitch Cock clogging up the lane. Uh, 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 um, Jalen Brunson having the ball in his hands, uh, RJ clogging up the lanes, and Julius having the ball in his hands. And so you can't have like that mix and not have at least one player who opens up the floor and spreads the floor. So, I mean, that's really why, you know, I, I wholeheartedly believe that Quentin Grimes is the X factor. You know, we need, we need him to shoot really well, because again, we're not thinking about it because it's the off season, but Julius, Mitch, Jalen Brunson, RJ, their games really clogs the lane. Yeah, no doubt, fam. We saw late in the Miami series how much we needed Quentin Grimes' shooting when Josh Hart was playing. And, and we know what Hart can bring, hustle and rebounding and how important he is to close games as well. Yeah. But Quentin Grimes' is shooting, it's going to come down to who's hitting shots this year because there's Dante. If RJ shooting well, if Hart can drill some open threes, if Deuce McBride continues to grow offensively like you said there's so many guys that aren't the guy yeah yet. yeah how many guys can you have that aren't the guy and i think for quentin grimes there's a lot of pressure man he was he was the untouchable and yes. um yep yeah. and uh yeah this team just needs what he brings is all i'm trying to say in terms of the x factor uh gerard's got a great question i'll kick it to you first <laughs> what guy will the knicks need to win a chip um, Gerard, do you mean who are presently on the roster or who aren't on the roster yet? Um, I think he means if, who do we need to acquire? Uh, well, I mean, yeah. we can actually play this game. Let's just do this. I mean, we have a few minutes. Um, yeah. let's do the, let's do a feasibility study. Um, in other words, what players that we've heard people talk about ending up on the Knicks are realistic, are really, really realistic. Um, so for example, Joel Embiid, I don't think is a realistic object, uh, a realistic option. I think it's a great option to talk about, but I don't see Philadelphia trading yeah. to the Knicks. Like it's just not realistic. What do you think, CT? No, I agree. The only thing I could see, and, and many fans have mentioned this, credit to them. I think he would have to get aggressive and say, New York or nowhere. How about you? I still like. I still struggle. Like, for example, Donovan Mitchell, I know he didn't voice it in this way when he was with Utah. Everyone knew he wanted to come to the Knicks. I don't think, oh, Dame, okay, quintessential example. Dame made it abundantly clear that he wanted to go to Miami. Um, I don't think he's playing in South Beach next year. So wow. I don't think, you know, I, I think that we have to avoid the idea that just because a player demands to go to a particular location that every yeah. player will receive the benevolence of the organization adhering and and, and 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 dealing with their wishes i don't think that's necessarily true so i don't i don't think that daryl morey and philadelphia will make it easy to acquire joel Embiid, particularly to an to an eastern conference rival that's 90 minutes away i just don't see it yeah yeah and i could also see a team out west like you said with okc with okay that, yeah. that could be the perfect time to make their all-in move i mean sga is, is is ready he's he's, he's 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 more than ready yeah yeah go ahead all right so joel and you're a no i'm a no uh let's do this one uh zion Zion, you're getting more warm in terms of... Um, I've got the Pelicans and the Clippers as the two teams to most watch closely in the West, uh, fam, because there's, they're multiple years into a, into a process, and the process ain't going anywhere so far. Um, and I really feel like the Paul George thing with the Clippers could be, could be revisited if the Clippers don't start well. And I think Zion noise will definitely go up a notch if um if they don't start well but i feel like brandon ingram could be just as equal as a as a, a target for the knicks um what do you say you've heard me on this program say for many a year, like for almost a year and a half um my preferred choice would be a brandon brandon ingram 
um, especially because we've seen him develop in a way that it is quite appetizing, where he could he could actually fulfill a number of different needs that the Knicks have. Um, outside shooting, length, um, just ability to score above the defense. Zion leaves a lot of questions. I, I think that's the concern, is that I think Zion is gettable for the right price, but there's sometimes, there's, there's something called in economics, the law of sunken costs, like where you're just pouring in extra money for something that's not worth it. I don't know, I think that Zion, I don't know if he's the player that you want to allocate so many trade assets so so much for and i can't believe i'm actually saying this you know several years into his career but at this point i don't know if that's the one i think he's gettable i don't know if he's the one that you should be looking at and and, and again like i don't know if the extent to which zion is available i don't know yeah it also depends who you're fitting them with and who uh, who wants to play together? I think that's going to yeah. be a factor as well. Like, uh, let's say, for example, if it, if it was Paul George, I think he has such a close relationship with Randall. Randall yeah. would most likely stay, and it'd be someone else, another wing outgoing, and then Paul George plays next to Randall. If it's Carl Anthony Towns, you would have to think Randall or Mitch yeah. might might need to go. Otherwise, how do you fit? How do you fit him in? So yeah, it's it's fair to speculate on in terms of how do they fit. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's let's do one more. Else? Donovan Mitchell. Man, you're getting more warmer as we go. Yeah. Um, Donovan Mitchell is not just the player, but I want to get your thoughts on this. The way I'm looking at it is, his contract situation is uh, a situation that's causing urgency for Cleveland. Yes. And that's yeah. playing into our hands. Finally, yeah. the Knicks will be in a position where there's leverage. Yes. Where, okay, your contract is running out. Your team isn't sitting pretty. Like, yeah. he can call the shots. Yeah. Like, and if I want to go to New York, I could scare some other teams off. The Knicks could get inside word. I think that's the, the right now, as we sit here today, whether he fits or you, you want him or you don't, I think Donovan Mitchell is the easiest pathway to finding himself as a New York Nick. And I see you nodding. Yeah, I, and I think we have to, I'm going to be really clear about this. I am not saying that I want Donovan Mitchell. I'm saying that he, like you just said, he might be the easiest player to acquire because he can more, more than these other players, he can, he can demand where he'd like to go and he has more leverage, leverage, and because if he has more leverage, that likely gives the Knicks more leverage. Now, there's a difference between easier player to get and ideal player to get. And I think that's where we are, which is really very difficult, is that the ideal player and the easier player to get are not necessarily the same in this instance. I think that Donovan Mitchell would probably come here the same way that Jalen Brunson did, where he's signing a free agent deal no matter what. I also think it's possible to acquire Donovan Mitchell in a trade. Um, but I think that's the issue is that is Donovan Mitchell the best complement to Jalen Brunson? Um, that's the struggle. Um, and, I, and I think that's where a lot of I think a lot of Knicks fans are feeling the sense of frustration. They want us to make a deal. They want the Knicks to make a deal. I just think that Leon Rose is not going to make a deal just for the sake of making a deal. Yeah. And just on to piggyback on that final point you made, I think mm -hmm. that there's pros and cons for the Knicks not being urgent. And the, the, the pro is that we have another year to see what Grimes and Barrett and how this all looks. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing at all. I think this year is going to show our flaws and what needs to be really upgraded. And I don't think after this year there can be any more excuses there can't be any more excuses for a player that doesn't produce this year if this team is not rebuilding, which they're not. And yeah. we're trying to we're trying to get to that next level with Brunson heading into his prime. I love all of our players and I root for their success, but I just know my my brain is telling me at the end of this year there's going to be some some pieces that don't fit um, because we're yeah. we're not a championship team. No. And, and again, you have to look at it in terms of the greater landscape. You have to look at it. I think that uh, mm. Milwaukee has has 
you know, really planted its flag. And you have to make deals according to where the rest of the league is, where the rest of the conference is. And we haven't even touched the Western Conference. So um, we haven't mentioned, you know, uh, Phoenix. We haven't mentioned uh, a number of the other teams out West. We haven't mentioned Denver. Uh, we have to put respect on their names, their pedigrees, and their rotations. So, uh, yeah, we're in a very, very interesting pace, place right now. There's two quick names I'll throw out there because they're honorable mentions. OG mm-hmm. Ananobi was a name that the Knicks were hot for, but the the the, the, the fractured relationship with Toronto yeah. is yeah. just not is not not feasible until he finds himself on another team. The other yeah. one is Zach Levine, which yeah. you know we know we revisited last year and the agent situation. That's another wait and see with the Bulls, fam. That's that's the stuff that 2K doesn't take into consideration. That's the thing that the ESPN trade machine does not take into consideration. Agent relationships, front office relationships, I can't foresee in any near future where the Raptors and the Knicks are making any deals. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. Yeah, man. Um, outside of that, is there anything else that, that you want to add? Um, we've got, obviously, tomorrow night and then back-to-back finalizing the preseason against Washington. We should see a full rotation, in my opinion. The Evan Fournier story yeah. is the thing to watch. Yeah, someone someone in the um, someone earlier mentioned that D Rose and uh, I'm sorry I'm not mentioning. I usually try to refer to everyone specifically by their their handles, but someone mentioned earlier that D Rose and Evan Fournier were simply they were behaving the way that they were because they were professional. I understand what you're saying, but the reason why it's really important that you have um, professionals in your locker room. Is because remember, this is a league that loves drama. Think about how many shows that there are on ESPN, talk shows, podcasts that are dedicated to locker room drama. People are going to be eating up the Philadelphia story because it's drama. People ate up the Brooklyn Nets last season because of the drama. You don't want the perception around the league for to be that the Knicks are somewhere where the locker room, there's upheaval, there are people who are discontent with regards to their minutes, people are questioning the coach, people are questioning the front office. That's what a lot of people used to think about the Knicks. We don't want that because that will not attract top level elite players. We don't want that kind of drama. So yes, they were professional. We want that. We don't want that kind of drama in our locker room. So that's really yeah. the one big piece that I wanted to drop off with. Yeah, facts. Uh, the way it, we're, we're going to run this like a business, we'd love yeah. to invite everyone to the cookout, everyone to the campfire, and uh, sing kumbaya. But um, you know, there's only 15 roster spots, and and I think the Knicks have have done well to to fill out the back end of their roster as well with these two ways. Um, they, uh, yeah, I could have definitely uh, lived with Taj Gibson coming on board uh, mm-hmm. for the backup four spot. Um, but maybe we want to keep a spot open to see what happens as well. Um, uh, interestingly, though, EJ, I want to ask your thoughts about a prediction at the trade deadline because the Knicks have made a move in season. Every year, Leon Rose has been yeah. here. Do you think that's a real possibility once again? Uh, you know, you, you, have, you, have, <laughs> you have to judge people by what they show you. And Leon Rose has showed you the past three off seasons that he's going to do a deal. It's going to be a deal one deal. And for the most part, these are deals that are along the margins. They're not going to be earth shattering. The Josh Hart deal was a relatively significant deal, but it wasn't something like, you know, that left a lot of Knicks fans saying to themselves, oh my gosh, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, But he does incremental deals. Um, So I do not believe given his track record, he has yet to prove that he's going to pull off a mid major, a mid season major deal. So, given his track record, I do not foresee there being a major deal this off, this mid season. And we have another key figure in the front office, officially vice Rosas. president of basketball ops. Man, a guy who's in touch with what Tibbs wants. I remember there was something that stood out to me. Berman said at the combine, Tom Thibodeau and Gerson Rosas were seated together next yeah. to each other for four hours. Yeah. That says a lot. That says a lot. Um, one of the things that we can pride ourselves with regards to this podcast, we are in the land of many Knicks podcasts, um, but we were one of the first, if not the first podcast to talk about 
the extent to which there was um, front office disharmony. Um, and that was about two years ago. Um, and that is never a good thing in terms of the health and viability of a front office, um, of the health and viability rather of an MBA organization. If your front office and your coaching staff, they, they have beef with one another, it's really hard. It's really hard for that organization to be healthy. Um, so what I think we're seeing is that um, we're seeing a little bit more alignment in terms of the front office, in terms of the coaching staff, and in terms of what kind of players that Tom Thibodeau would like for his um, for his roster to have. Um, that doesn't mean we'll always agree with it. But for me, I would much prefer to have a front office in alignment with its coaching staff. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, we need that. And uh, Tibbs is a, clearly a huge uh, figure in personnel decisions now as mm -hmm. well. Um, uh, quick thoughts on the Julius Randle uh, moving agencies. Do you feel like it's nothing? He he followed, you know, his longtime friend and, and marketing executive over. Do you feel like it's him positioning uh, something for, for the future and what's to come or just trying to maximize his next contract? That's a good question. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where he has not revealed. Uh, obviously, he was asked about this um, yeah. opening week, opening uh, press conferences and, and interviews, and he did not reveal a lot. So to me, that's a strategic, like, you know, if you ever take like rhetoric classes, um, you know, and, or like, you know, uh, courses where they talk about um, dealing with publicity or dealing with uh, management. Uh, one of the things that they teach you is to learn how to answer a question without answering the question. That <laughs> was a really strategic answer, which to me reveals that there's something there. And he may have really been coached or it, it, there was a discussion where he and his team came to the decision that we know we're going to get this question and we've prepped an answer for this question because we do not want to address what might, what might, and I'm saying what might be there. So that was a really smart answer, but that then uncovers to me that there might be something there. Yeah, I think it's not more of one thing as I speculated after the um, the, the event happened. I feel like if we're doing a pie graph, it's mm -hmm. maybe 25%, you know, he's positioning himself for the next contract, 25% uh, more off-court endorsements, mm -hmm. um, you know, wanting more opportunities to open up. You know, he signed the Skechers deal. Maybe yeah. there was just a disagreement with, with the vision Aaron Mintz had. Yeah. You know, things, things like that can happen. Um, but I do think there's a percentage of, of him looking out for him, you know? Yes. And also, like, the idea of, you know, Julius is now, there's something, we have to forget that these guys, they mature, they age in front of us. And so Julius, I believe, is, what, 27 at this point? 27, 28? Um, yeah, 28. There's something that happens. He was he got into the league. He was what 20, 20 something, 20, 21. Yeah. Um, he's a man now. And you know, you're going to start to now speak for yourself more. You've been around the league for a while. You want certain things as opposed to being told these are the things that are available yeah. for you. Uh, I think signing the Skechers deal is a remarkable was almost similar to Star Starberries um, back in the day, where it's like yeah. I want to create something for myself. Um, so yeah, you start to see those kinds of moves as a player matures, gets older. Um, so I do agree with you that there might be a percentage of that. That's that particular issue. Yep. Um, but again, you know, there might be other things there. As and well. brand image. I feel like he's the most, one of the most disrespected, uh, all NBA players, um, for what he's achieved, you know, his yeah. persona around the league is not, you know, w I would know for a fact he's not where he would want it to be. You know, if I'm an yes. all-star, all-NBA player, like, I should be talked about with the Bradley Beal, Zach Levines, all of this. I, I feel like most people have Randall uh, around the league. Non-Knicks people have him lower. Oh, absolutely. But, but that's yeah. also what happens when you when you are part of a larger organization, your larger, your larger agency that has a number of players it has to prioritize. You know, so when you are one of many... Sometimes it's more difficult to stand out. So um, that could also be part of the business of I want to feel prioritized, particularly given my resume the past three or four seasons. Yep, no doubt, fam. Well, we're, the show's coming to a wrap up. Appreciate everyone for rocking along. Anyone that's just jumped in, uh, rewind, catch Mark Berman's predictions with EJ. Uh, the preseason's just about to wind down. Two more games. We got more guests later this week. 
uh, Mike Vaccaro, New York Post, Bill Daughtry, New York sports radio legend. And uh, it's going to be a hectic week, uh, but EJ's back in the fall. The streets are buzzing. Thank you so much, CT. Hey, everyone, do me a favor. Smash the like, smash the subscribe. Share this with at least one person. This is a show for smart Knicks fans. So we really want to encourage you as much as possible to support the channel. Um, we have love for everyone who's doing their thing on, on YouTube, but really show love to CT, myself, um, and all of the top quality guests that end up on this show. Um, they're doing it out of love. They're doing it out of, for you guys, for you, for all of us, for all of us who are fans. And so we need you to smash the like, we need you to smash the subscribe. It helps us, it helps us with the algorithms. It helps us to really get the kinds of upper level quality NBA analysts, writers, contributors. The more you smash those likes, the more you share the show, the more we'll be able to get those top notch guests like a Mark Berman, like a Bill Daughtry, GOAT, GOAT, GOAT level, Mike Vaccaro, uh, Jake Fisher. Um, it's because of you guys, it's because of how many times you press like, how many times you share the show, share the show. And again, I can't wait for the start of this season. Thank you so much, CT. Throwing it back to you, man. Yeah, no doubt. You said it, man. And we've got more guests, new guests, a new year. We try to uh, add more value to the show and appreciate what people want to see. Uh, let us know if you want to see more things, um, more Knicks-related guests, more national NBA guests, former players. Um, we'll be doing a, you know, a podcast forum this year as well. Um, some fan interactions with the, sh with the post game shows as well. Um, the Knicks, yeah, this is a, this is a great era. I feel like we're on the verge of, uh, moving into contention and I think we deserve great content. And uh, with that said, appreciate everyone for rocking along CT and EJ. We'll see you soon tomorrow night post game against Boston beat